<laughs> All right, today we're going to talk about Chapter 7, States of Consciousness. Now, this chapter correlates to about 2-4% to of the national exam, which is all in roundabout ways. You know, this is not a big chapter, but it's always a chapter that's really interesting to most people who uh, read it. Now, states of consciousness. States means, you know, your present state of mind, so to speak. And when you look at consciousness, that's your, simply your attention. So, conscious awareness includes everything that you're consciously aware of. In other words, you're aware of it at a given moment. Okay, so you're consciously aware right now, you're listening to me, you know, speak about this chapter. Pre-conscious or the subconscious level. This refers to the level right beneath, okay, conscious awareness. And what Sigmund Freud said was that simply this is where, you know, memories or things that have happened recently are stored. In other words, with pre-conscious awareness, it's not very hard to bring you into conscious awareness. So you walk into my class, even though you're presently not thinking about what you had for dinner last night, okay, when you walked in, I can easily bring it into conscious awareness by simply asking you what you had for dinner last night. Now, the unconscious is material that's absent from conscious awareness. So a simple question is not going to bring something out of the unconscious into your conscious awareness. This is somewhat pushed, as Freud would say, well beneath the surface of awareness. So if you picture an iceberg, which you'd see with most books, at the surface level and above would be conscious awareness. That's part of an iceberg you can see. Just beneath the surface, so in other words, you can swim to it rather easily, would be your pre-conscious or subconscious. But you would need some type of apparatus to get down to the unconscious. You know, scuba gear wouldn't be enough. You would need something to help you bring down. And that's how difficult it is to sometimes access the unconscious. Now, Freud believed that even though it's absent and you're not aware of unconscious thoughts or desires or fears, that these thoughts and you know, fears direct, indirectly affect your personality, indirectly affect your behavior. A lot of times with the unconscious, this is where the I don't know why I get this thought. I don't know why I have the tendency to pull away. So the I don't know, you know something bothers you. You just don't know why it bothers you. There's a good description of your unconscious. Now, typical good question here. Suzanne is paying close attention to her teacher as he lectures about the history of psychology. Now, she's aware of what he's saying. So which one is mean that you're aware? That's your conscious awareness. Okay, another good question. Carol's friends ask Carlos, I should say, Carlos' friends, what he ate for dinner last night. Carlos hesitates a few moments and then is able to remember. So again, he wasn't presently thinking about what he had for dinner last night. It was just beneath the level. So most of you, you would have guessed that was the pre-conscious or the subconscious level. Now, explaining the levels of consciousness. And this kind of goes back to chapter 14 with the history of psychology. Philosophers were first, first interested in the role of consciousness. Okay, People like Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, they were questioning our existence. They were questioning our thoughts. They were trying to study our existence. Okay, Now, they looked at basically the relationship between conscious experience and the physical brain. Okay? Now, dualism was the belief that the mind and body are separate. Okay? And this was supported by Socrates and Plato. And it no longer is seen as you know, a possible explanation. Materialism is the mind and body are the same. And this was supported by Aristotle. Now, this was also you know, supported through the damage to the physical brain causes disruptions in conscience or mental process. So somebody that takes a sharp blow to the head often will experience retrograde amnesia. So in other words, what they remember, how they process information, is going to be affected. And that does lend support to materialism. Now, one state of consciousness, or another, another, in other words, their state of mind, okay, is simply of a particular stimulus at any given moment. What was your state of mind when you ate dinner? What was your state of mind when you were in class? Were you sleepy? Were you alert? Were you daydreaming? Now, William James, who again, father of American psychology, functionalism should ring a bell, believe that consciousness is like a stream that always changes but keeps on flowing. And I like that saying. So when you look at a stream, many things can be flowing down the stream at the same time. The whole point is they're flowing at the same moment. So you could see, you know, like, a, for example, a piece of paper, a boat, a person. They're all flowing at the same time, okay? So what it means is how he relates this is that many things can flow down the stream, but they are always flowing at the same time. You may not be focused on music, in the background while you're talking to somebody, but it's affecting your consciousness. So like a stream, a stream of water coming towards you, many things can be in that stream. That's how you would look at consciousness. In other words, a lot of things can be coming to you at one time, 
that are all going to affect you. The point is, they're all affecting you. Now, circadian rhythms, okay, these are repeated fluctuations or changes, such as sleeping and waking that occur over a 25 period of time. Now, what I mean by fluctuations is there's parts of the day you're alert, and then there's other parts within the day that you get very tired. Same with your hunger, same with your body temperature, same with your physical exertion. So in other words, your day is kind of like this, up and down. You're alert, then you're a little bit sleepy, okay? Like a lot of people are alert around 9 in the morning, but then tend to get sleepy around 3. And again, that's a fluctuation. Now, in terms of the connections, in terms of what governs these circadian rhythms, okay, because we literally are kind of like a clock. What's referred to the clock is called the supercosmetic nucleus. It's called the internal clock, and it's located within the hypothalamus. Remember, the hypothalamus is your drive center. Sleeping, eating, wakefulness, okay? Now, where the supercosmetic nucleus is located, it receives information from the retina, okay, regarding the lighting conditions outside. So, all information coming from the retina is also going to the supercosmetic nucleus. Now, in response, the neurons in this nucleus trigger the release of a hormone called melatonin. Now, this is a hormone, you know, from chapter 2 that's produced by the pineal gland. Now, where this is kind of going is a good couple examples to explain to you. When melatonin is released, you become tired. So when melatonin is released, you mellow out, you become tired. Everybody remember. When the production is decreased, you begin to wake up. Now, remember, this is all connected to the retina detecting light conditions. So when it becomes dark out, okay, the retina obviously recognizes this darkness. Rods are being activated. Okay? Information is then sent to a variety of areas in the brain. Supercosmetic nucleus is one of them. It recognizes that the information from the retina is saying it's getting dark, and in response, it instructs the pineal gland to release melatonin, and you start to become tired. In reality, or in actual experience, when you turn off the lights at night, you instantly will start to become tired because melatonin will simply be increased. Now, when you wake up in the morning, it's advisable to turn on the lights because in response to the light, the melatonin production will be decreased. Now, when you look at the next statement, when external cues are not present, our circadian rhythms tend to expand to a 25-hour day. So when I say when external cues are present, for example, being in a casino, all right, where there is you know, no outside influences in terms of sunlight, you lose track of time. So some people, what it's going to be is their you know, circadian rhythms will be altered. It will be affected by about an hour. Now, when environmental cues do not match the internal clock, because basically your supercosmetic nucleus works with the cues from the environment, you know, the rising and setting of the sun, for example. Now, if you, for example, go out to Vegas or L.A. and you're three to four hours behind, your internal clock, supercosmetic nucleus, is set for this environment this time schedule, being in Michigan, but your environmental cues are off. So in other words, it can be affected by three hours. So your body will naturally start to get tired because it's used to this environment, but it's not going to match the fact that it's still light out in Vegas. And some people have to take melatonin. Okay, and obviously, you know why not. Now, what hormone released by the pineal gland causes a person to become drowsy? You mellow up. So that, of course, right there you went to D, melatonin. Now, John traveled from Nashville, home with the Titans, to Los Angeles yesterday. He has had a hard time adapting to the time change. I think I know why. Last night he found it hard to fall asleep, and during the day he was, had a hard time staying awake. The time change has affected huh? what is in charge of his body fluctuations. And most of you right now are going to letter A because you've been listening to this lecture, and that's circadian rhythms. Now, stages of sleep, which is obviously a big part of this chapter, states consciousness, all right, what's your state when you're sleeping? You're sleeping. Now, researchers are able to measure, okay, a person's state of mind during sleep because of an EEG, which, manage, which monitors changes in brain activity. So depending on the EEG readout, they can dictate what, you know, simply type of brain waves you are displaying, which is going to indicate your level of alertness or tiredness. Now, beta waves, the person's wide awake. You better be awake, is the way I like to say it. Now, when are beta waves shown? Usually when you're doing something exciting or new for the first time. Okay? So, for example, 
first day of school, well, you would probably show beta waves a lot more than probably the third week of school. Alpha waves, the person's awake but drowsy, which is your typical kid who's doing like a routine thing in class, like lecturing every day. Because it doesn't require much brain activity to sit and take notes, often what the brain will show is an alpha wave type of brain activity. Now, these two are more connected with the person sleeping. Theta waves, okay, slower waves ready to fall asleep. Theta waves is the kid kind of nodding off, all right, just like this. Their eyes are very heavy. Delta waves is very low brain activity, and basically it's connected with deep sleep. Okay? Now, difficult good question here. Jen is excited to be taking the AP psychology exam. Who wouldn't? She is full alert and ready to handle the task at hand. Now, which way of brain activity is Jen displaying? Wide awake. Better be awake, right? Of course, most of you have that great notion. Just said C. Now, as Tracy sits in class, she grows tired. She's developed. She's having a hard time paying attention to the teacher and often loses her place in her book. Tracy is experiencing which type of brain waves? Now, most of you probably would have picked D, alpha waves. Awake but drowsy. Theta waves, they're pretty much going to be asleep. All right? They're in the first you know, stage of sleep, stage one, which we'll get to in a second. Speaking of, now, this nice handy dandy chart here displays the sleep stages, brain activity correlated to it, and the common characteristics. Now, NREM, which stands for non rapid eye movement, that means your eyes aren't moving underneath your lids, which are our eyelids. Typically, you're going to see alpha and theta waves, like I just mentioned. Now, this is NREM stage one. It only lasts a few minutes. This is basically your head goes down. Now, where you see the person can quickly wake up, I'll use the notion of a kid who falls asleep during class. If the teacher starts moving in the direction and the voice starts getting louder, that's enough to wake the, the kid up. So really when you have alpha and theta waves, you're awake and sleeping at the same time. Okay? Now, they often experience a hypogenic hallucination, which most of you probably relate to. It's a vivid sensory experience. This is the kid who's falling asleep. And when I say hypogenic hallucination, it's very real. And often it's associated with falling. So you see a kid often snap back and look around, and they're kind of shocked that they're sitting in a classroom because of the hallucination they just had, they were falling out of their chair or whatever else. Now, it's also the myoclonic jerk is characteristic of any arm stage one, and it's an involuntary muscle spasm. You know, you might see the, the jimmy arm, where their arm moved really quickly. Now, that's again only a few minutes. Some will make it into NREM stage two which this is the start of true sleep. This is the kid who's going to sleep now. Okay. Now this is theta waves primarily. So again, they're pretty out. They're out of the alpha waves. Alpha waves are only really with stage one. They're awake but drowsy. Theta waves, now your uh, brain activity is slowing down even more. Now, sleep spindles in EEG patterns are sudden burst of brain activity, which a lot of times can kind of look like twitching, you know, a little up and down. Now, once they start to get into the theta, starts going to the delta, they start to enter NREM stage 3. Now there's a good chance this kid's not going to get up if the bell rings. Now, this is delta waves, and it's considered NREM stage 3 when 20% of brain activity shows the delta waves. So, delta waves is deep sleep, no brain activity. So, 20%, you know, they're, they're almost in deep sleep. I mean, they're pretty much out. They're probably not going to notice if someone walks next to them or gets up out of their chair. But when they enter stage four NREM, they're up. All right, they're sleeping. Okay, this is going to take some energy or effort to wake this kid up because the delta waves are at about 50% of brain activity, which means they're not going to hear much in terms of the external world. In fact, it's pretty close to saying their brain is asleep. Now, when I said the person doesn't experience sensory stimulation, you're gonna you can do this. And they're probably still going to sleep. You're probably going to have to nudge the kid, which obviously coming out of deep sleep can be a little frightful, but you know, we fell asleep in class, so that happens. Now, this is also referred to as slow wave sleep or S sleep, okay, which is deep sleep. Now, REM sleep, here's the interesting thing. This is characterized by beta waves. So in other words, the brain is awake, which is you know key to a couple things I'm going to tell you. One, brain activity becomes more active. 85% of dreams occur in REM sleep. 
You know, REM, rapid eye movement, the eyes are moving under the lids. Muscle activity is suppressed. This is referred to as muscle atonia. In other words, your brain is awake, but your body is asleep. This prevents you, muscle atonia, from acting out your dreams. Okay? Dogs often will act out their dreams. Now, physiological arousal is high. Heart rate, blood pressure, that's pumping. Eyes move back and forth, like I said. But this is also called paradoxical sleep, because the brain is awake, but the body is asleep. Now, REM sleep, good question here, characterized by delta brain activity. That doesn't make sense, because that's deep sleep. Sensation of breathing and heavy snoring? No. Muscle antonio and high levels of activity in the brain. And that's exactly right. Letter C. Body is asleep, antonio, and the brain is uh, wide awake. Now, sequence of sleep. Most people experience four to six cycles of sleep, depending on how long they're asleep. Now, what do I mean by a cycle of sleep? The first cycle, notice I'm saying first, begins with NREM stage one. This is the first few minutes when the person's falling asleep. Now, this is the only time in the cycle, unless the kid gets up, that they're going to go through stage one again. So kind of keep that in mind. Then they go for about 20 minutes into stage two NREM. Then after about 20 minutes, roughly the next 40 minutes are spent in stage three and four. That's deep sleep. Now, here, once they're in stage three or four, okay, for about 40 minutes, they start to wake back up, and the sequence reverses. Now, when I say wake back up, the brain starts to wake back up. So they go from four, stage three and four, then they go back, mostly into stage three, then into stage two, but instead of going back to stage one, because stage one's when they're falling asleep, they go into REM. Now, REM sleep, okay, is roughly about five to 15 minutes, and that's gonna be when you're actively dreaming, okay? Now, a couple things I want to add to this. As sleep continues, periods of REM sleep gets longer. So you're going to do the bulk of your dreaming, the second half of your sleep. So if you go to bed at 9, probably 9 to 12, not much dreaming. But probably about 1 to 4 and 5 in the morning, you're going to have some moments maybe where you wake up or you can recall the dream because your brain's going to be pretty wide awake. Now, the last few sleep cycles, remember there's about 4 to 6. So you're talking 5 and 6 cycles now, the 5th and 6th cycle are primarily NREM stage 2 and REM sleep, which lasts up to 40 minutes now. So at first time, when you go through REM sleep, it's about 5-6 minutes. And then it quickly goes back into stage 3 and stage 4 deep sleep. But the last couple cycles, when you enter into stage 2, REM is going to last a little bit longer after it follows stage 2. Now, over the course of a person's life, NREM stages 3 and 4 decrease. Right, and that's deep sleep again. By a late adult, with most of them average about 20 minutes compared to a young child who spends more than two years or two hours in deep sleep. And part of the reason is, is during deep sleep, the pituitary gland, which remember that's Master P, is secreting a growth hormone. And obviously when you're little, you're growing more than when you're older. Now, good question here that you could see. As an individual sleeps throughout the night, which two stages of sleep become longer? Most of you. Obviously, you dream more in your second half, and stage two is the gateway to REM sleep, so most of you pick that one up right away as letter C. Now, functions of sleep, obviously all of us need our sleep, you get cranky if you don't, but a person who's not getting enough sleep experiences fatigue and irritability, but where they have a problem is focusing on tasks, especially boring or repetitive tasks like driving. That's why you get the risk of some people falling asleep when they're driving. Driving doesn't require much brain activity because you do it so much. Same with taking notes in class. Doesn't require much brain activity when you do it quite a bit. Okay, and that's where you have the tendency to nod off, which obviously in class, that's one thing, but nodding off behind a wheel, that can be dangerous. Now, a person who does not get enough REM sleep will experience something called REM rebound. Instead of going through the normal sequence of sleep, which is that REM one, then two, three, four, and then four, three, two, and then REM sleep, this person goes and skips all the NREM and goes right into dreaming. This is the person who falls asleep at home and goes right into a dream. Okay? And it's because you're just not getting enough sleep. Now, sleep theory, several areas play a, a role in the cycle of sleep. First of all, the neurotransmitter is serotonin. The serotonin is a stabilizer. That plays a big role in sleep. So does GABA, which GABA is a neurotransmitter that inhibits, slows down brain activity. So it only makes sense to be released. Now, the brain area reticular formation, pay particular reticular attention, obviously is in charge of our sleep cycles. 
Now, specifically, what runs through the reticular formation is something called the Ascending Reticular Activating System, ARAS. It's good to know. Good to know. It's comprised of several different nerves. Remember, nerves are bundles of axons that run through the reticular formation that affect our level of arousal. Now, ponds in the midbrain are responsible for REM sleep. So a lot of people assume that ponds in the midbrain is what is responsible for our dreams. It's during REM sleep, we dream. Now, Sleep theory is the restorative theory of sleep. Sleep is necessary for the body to repair itself. All right? And obviously, there's some truth to that. Now, you have REM sleep and NREM sleep. Okay? And with restorative theory, let me explain the difference. REM sleep allows the brain to improve the functioning, so it repairs the brain. Now, this also is important for forming new memories. So this is why you want to get a good night's sleep before a test. Because basically what it's doing is the GABA is being released to hold together the memories, okay, as well as the glutamate. Now, this is because the amygdala and hippocampus are active during REM sleep, which is why some of your dreams are emotional amygdala, and some of your dreams are remembered hippocampus, processing new memories, explicitly. Now, NREM sleep restores the body. This is why when you've had a physically exhausting day, more than likely you're going to spend more time in NREM sleep 3 and 4, which mean, may mean you might not dream at all that night. Okay? Now, good question here. Restorative theory of sleep suggests that blank sleep helps the brain. So most of you said REM, two choices here. I'm going to look at the second part. And blank helps the body, and that's NREM. So good job, people, if you said letter B. Now, some other sleep theories, adaptive theory of sleep, sleep is a behavior that promotes the survival. And this is your evolutionary Darwin theory. Remember evolutionary Darwin, survival, reproduction? It's based on the principle that humans and animals sleep when it's dangerous to be awake, which is nighttime. Bad things happen. Behavioral theory of sleep, we sleep because there's no more stimulation. That probably applies to a lot of you. You just go to bed because there's nothing on TV and there's nothing more to do. And you finally kind of give up. You surrender to sleep. Now, some sleep disorders, most people experience a sleep disorder from time to time. Because a lot of times sleep disorders are connected with stress. Who doesn't have stress? Most common problem is insomnia, which all of us, I'm sure, have had a version of. And that is the ability to fall asleep or stay asleep. Very frustrating waking up in the middle of the night and then you can't fall back to sleep. Now, if insomnia occurs more than a month, then maybe help might be required. Because here's the thing, all of us are going to have sleepless nights once in a while. We had a lot going on the next day or had a bad day. You kind of get the message. Now, nice little chart here for you. Common sleep disorders. Narcolepsy, okay, is falling, suddenly falling asleep when you don't want to fall asleep. Like in a bowling alley, like in Deuce Bigelow, or when, you know, you're doing something where you shouldn't sleep, like driving or, you know, studying. Now, Sleep apnea is simply when you stop breathing in your sleep, okay? And often this affects people that may have, you know, some heart issues or, you know, might have some airways that can somewhat get blocked. Now, some metabolism is sleepwalking, all right? And this is occurring primarily, if, you know, sleepwalking, I always get asked a question. That's primarily stage four. You remember the brain's, you know, not, not awake, so it's a good chance they're not going to remember if they did it. Now, this could also be kind of linked genetically. Other than that, they're, uh, what they have found is it happens a lot of times in children and adolescents. Very uh, untypical in adult. Now, bedwetting, nocturnal urinaris, occurs in our NARM stage 4, which is when we talk about learning and conditioning. This is going to be uh, the bed and path treatment to wake people up. Now, night terrors and nightmares are two that you often have to know. All right, now, one thing you do have to know from this list with sleep disorders is you could get a question on night terrors versus nightmares. Night terrors are very frightening. Now, they usually happen with little kids. The difference is night terrors occur in stage three and four, which often is why they can't remember anything because their brain's not awake. And they are. They're, they're not only terrifying for the child, but they're terrifying for someone to watch because literally their you know, muscles are constricting, they're heavy breathing, panting, things like that. Now, nightmares which are more common in all ages, and occur in REM sleep. And they're often because it's REM sleep and our brains are awake, it can be called, it can be recalled. So a lot of us, because we can explain the nightmare, we often can alleviate any type of, you know, disturb for the nightmare. 
Now, REM sleep behavior disorder, which is one I described earlier, is when you act out your dreams physically. Dogs have a tendency to do this. Now, often if there's damage to the lower part of the brain, that's where maybe the little, you know, could be a possible explanation. And then sleep bruxism is grinding your teeth during your sleep. Now, dream theories, Freud basically kind of was the mainstay on this. Now, a couple you know, good terms here. Remember, dreams occur in REM sleep. Okay? Lucid dreaming, the individual has control over a dream storyline. They can control the action, the outcome, the direction of a dream. You know, I'm not going to say the word rare, but, you know, most people think they can do it, but in actuality, they can't. Now, evidence is shown during REM sleep. The frontal lobe areas are inactive. Now, that's important. That's kind of your sequence, your planning, you know, your inhibitions, your, you know, thought control, morality, which makes it hard to form new memories. Okay? Now, also, the neurotransmitters dopamine, norepinephrine, or epinephrine and serotonin are reduced during sleep, which are necessary for forming new memories, okay? Now, mental and physical during sleep, it's hard to remember. Some might not even remember going to the bathroom, especially it's possible they got up during, you know, deep sleep. Now, Jim has reported that he can control his dreams, you know, and most of you around the bath said, well, I know what that is, that's a lucid dream. Nice job there, people. Now, dream theories, Freud, like I said, was kind of the pioneer in this one, all right? He was very interested in it. And he believed that a lot of the unconscious, remember that's the portion of awareness that you're not aware of, that still affects you, can be traced to dreams. In fact, he had a book called The Interpretation of Dreams, and he basically came up with the quote, the royal road to knowledge of the unconscious mind comes from dreams. Now, dream analysis is the basically a technique that Freud and the psychoanalyst use. Psychoanalysis, you'll soon learn, is a method of therapy centers on Freud's beliefs, that dreams are comprised of two parts. The manifest content is the portion of the dream that you can remember. Storyline. The latent content is more the symbolic part of the dream. And this is what Freud thought was the deep-seated wishes of the unconscious. And this is what Freud was interested in. He felt that this symbolic part of the dream would lead to understanding the comprehension of the unconscious. Now, Another dream theory, activation synthesis theory of dreaming. Dreams develop because of random firing neurons. Neurons are sporadically firing like fireworks going off, you know, when you don't mean to, mean them to. And this primarily occurs in the lower brain area, which remember is your medulla, your reticular formation, you know, your alertness, your pons, your vital life functions. Now, these signals are being sent to the cortex in a random type of fashion. Okay. No rhyme or reason why they're you know, going off, so they're continuously going to the cortex, which is you know, what's trying to make sense out of things. Now, they're also going to the amygdala, your emotional center, your hippocampus, your new forming of memories, and eventually the brain's trying to put together these signals. And that's why a lot of times your dreams, because the frontal lobes are kind of shut down, you don't, they don't make a lot of sense, but you notice they're emotional, all right, and uh, they're kind of out of order. Okay? And also, you know, since frontal lobes are in control of inhibitions, that's why some of our dreams are a little bit bizarre. Now, hypnosis is an altered state of consciousness. Remember, state of consciousness, state of mind. That could produce increased responsiveness to suggestion that could turn to lead to changes in behavior. Now, smoking and losing weight are the two most common types that people seek in hypnotists. Now, children, young adolescents, seem to be most subjected to hypnosis. Now, a couple vocab terms here. post hypnotic suggestion, post being the key part there. Suggestions that may be carried over after the person has been hypnotized. You will not smoke. That's a post hypnotic suggestion. Okay, post hypnotic amnesia, meaning they can't recall what took place during the hypnotic session. Amnesia is loss, okay? So, in other words, their friend asked how was hypnosis, they're not going to really be able to describe it because they were under. Now, which of the following is an altered state of mind? Power suggestion comes into play. Most of you said right off the bat, it's hypnosis. Now, Nate has had problems quitting smoking in the past. Friend suggested to see a hypnotist. Nate, a bit reluctant, but agreed. After the hypnotic suggestion, the hypnotist told Nate, you no longer ever smoke again. 
That was, most of you are saying, well, that sounds like a suggestion. It happened after the hypnotic session, so we call that post-hypnotic session. Now, examining or explaining hypnosis. Ernest Hilgard's name you know, associated with hypnosis the most. And he had a theory called the neo-dissociation theory of hypnosis, where basically he said people experience multiple streams of consciousness. Remember what William James said, that consciousness is like a stream. Many things are flowing at you. Hypnosis, according to Hilgard, is what they've done is been able to put a fork in that stream. All right, and kind of keep the stream going, but in two different you know, paths now. Now, the first stream of consciousness is tuned to the hypnotic suggestions. Okay? They're, they're what they're saying to, what the hypnotist is saying to them. The second stream, called the hidden observer, is so distinct, it's a separate stream, that this is basically unattainable to the subject. Okay? And where, obviously, the thoughts are going to be controlled. Now, the role theory of hypnosis states, okay, that basically, that people who undergo hypnosis are conforming to the demands of the expected roles associated with the process of hypnosis. What that means is, some people go into hypnosis with this thought of what's supposed to happen. They're going to play a role. Okay? And this was Spanos theory. And this role, basically, they're living up to expectations. They know they're going to fall asleep, so they're kind of already, you know, being programmed to do that. Now, and that's kind of what is explained here. Role, belief, expectancy theory. And in Spanos belief, it could be explained through just simply behaving in the expectations of the hypnotist. You're going to get sleepy. Well, they're telling you you're going to get sleepy, so you probably will. Now, the last part of this, psychopharmacology, deals with an area of psychology that looks at the effects of psychoactive drugs. First of all, in order for a drug to have any type of effect on the brain, make us feel woozy, pain control, whatever, it has to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier. If it passes the blood-brain barrier, it's going to affect the brain. This blood-brain barrier is here to protect the brain from harmful things. And you ingest them, so you're making it easier now. Once a drug does pass the blood-brain barrier, this is kind of from chapter two. We just didn't hit it as much because I knew I was going to talk about it here. It's either an agonist, which is basically what it means is a mimic or excites a neurotransmitter. So it's designed to be the same thing as a neurotransmitter. Good example of that, Motrins are mimicking or the same thing as endorphins. Endorphins are in charge of pain control. And obviously, most of us take Motrins for pain. An antagonist blocks or inhibits a neurotransmitter. And what I mean by blocks, it stops the functioning of a neurotransmitter. Now you'll see antagonists when we talk about antidepressant medication, anti-anxiety medication, anti-meaning it blocks. Now, I always like to say an agonist is like a key that's duplicated to fit the lock. In other words, the real key will open the lock and a fake key, or I'm sorry, the duplicate key that you get done will also open that lock. An antagonist is like a key that fits the lock but it's slightly different and it now blocks the real key from entering. So if you've ever busted a key in your lock, the real key can no longer fit in there because you've busted the key off of it. So that's kind of like an antagonist. Now, some terms here, substance abuse is basically when drugs are more important than, you know, more meaningful things like family, friends, work, school, and so on. Psychological dependency is when a person basically has psychological reasons, okay, or beliefs that they need to have this drug in their system. Physical dependency is addiction. Okay? It results in the body's dependence on the drug to function. Now, if the body doesn't get the drug, you're going to experience withdrawal symptoms. With withdrawal symptoms, you're basically going to have the shakes, headaches. When we talk about negative reinforcement, that's going to be a nice time to bring this back up. Tolerance is the more of a drug you do, the more you need. And this is often seen over the course of a person's experience with the drug. At first, one or two drinks. They're feeling the effects. Now it's nine or ten drinks and so on. Ever since death quit smoking, she has experienced terrible headaches. Now she has a tremendous craving for nicotine. Deb is experiencing what kind? And most of you said her out the bat, and she complains sounds like a withdrawal to me. Exactly right. Now, here's some drug classifications. Okay? And this is a nice handy dandy chart for you. Okay, depressants, okay, how they affect the body is it slows down the central nervous system. Okay, remember central nervous system brain spot. It increases the number of GABA neurotransmitters, which inhibits brain activity, which is, slows down the brain activity as well. Examples, most of you guessed it, alcohol, barbiturates, sleeping pills, GHB. Now, psychological effects, mild euphoria, people seem to talk a lot more, 
outgoing, bad judgment, loss of inhibitions, because, yeah, most of you are saying that, alcohol affects the frontal lobes. Now, stimulants is the opposite. They speed up activity in the nervous systems, increase the release of norepinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter involved with alertness, and it also releases dopamine, which dopamine is a neurotransmitter involved in euphoria or pleasure. So, differences in depressants and stimulants. Stimulants excite you, depressants depress you. Some examples, amphetamines, cocaine, caffeine, nicotine, ecstasy, increased neural alertness, reduced fatigue, and here's the one thing, right here, point this out. Where I said it could result in induced psychosis. Psychosis is a break of reality. You're going to learn in the abnormal psych chapter that excessive dopamine is connected with the hallucinations of schizophrenia. You do too much cocaine here, you may have what's called induced psychosis, which means you bring the psychosis on yourself from doing too much drug that's having too much effect on the dopamine. Now, opiates are narcotics, cause sleepiness, relieve pain, agonists for endorphins. Agonists, remember, mimic. Endorphins are charge pain control. Hallucinogens also cause psychedelics. Similar to serotonin regulation of mood and perceptions. Examples of this, LSD, mescaline, ketamine, marijuana. Now, some of the symptoms, loss of reality, emotion, perception, everything kind of messed up. Now, good example here, depressed, depressed activity in the central nervous system, brain spinal cord. Which of the following is an example? Heroin, that's a psychedelic, cocaine is a stimulant, LSD, I'm sorry, heroin, opiate, LSD, psychedelic, or hallucinogen. And there's your uh, alcohol, which alcohol is depressant. That would be it for today, boys and girls.